Chris. Hello everyone, thanks for, for having me. It's really an honor to be, to be in this meetup, like the largest oh, pirata. <laughs> yeah, they already spoke about me. I've been in the open source community for quite a few years, in the Python one for, for 12 years, a bit more than 12 years. My background is in computer engineering and with a master in AI. As they said, I, for since a couple of months now, I've been in the Pandas core development team. I've been contributing for more than a year. Python Fellow, Numfocus Ambassador. I organize the London Python Sprints Group. I'll talk a bit at the end if I have time. And I work full time as a data scientist at Tesco. Uh, just quickly about pandas. How many of you haven't used pandas yet? Haven't? Just one person. Okay. <laughs> so the first part would be very short, and <laughs> that's good. I don't have, <laughs> I have lots of stuff to show. So yeah, Pandas was, was started by Wes McKinney in 2008. It's been 10 years now. He, he wanted just like to be able to do what Art does in, in Python, and from them, with the work for, from many volunteers, it's been, it's been growing what it is now. Pandas is huge. The API is really like only Sirius has 300 uh, 25 methods or attributes, data frame almost as much. It supports natively without any any other package or library, like more than 14 different formats, like of course like CSV, but like lots of, of stuff. And and yeah, it's literally like if you check the documentation of the API, it's more than 1,200 pages. So it's really 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 huge. It's estimated by the people mainly from Conda that track most of the downloads and the PyPy and that. The estimates are having about five to 10 million users, which is quite a lot. And as I said, it's developed by the community, meaning that it's very rare for core developers to be paid for the work, meaning that you should be feeling that, like contributing if you think that Pandas has something that can be improved and not expect any company in Silicon Valley to to fix it, if that's what you feel. And non focus is just an, an umbrella organization that represents basically all us, like not all us as, as the people from the projects, but all us as community. They are the ones that supporting events like, like this, conferences and, and everything. So yeah, I don't see non focus as a, someone external. It's basically just like the brand for, for all, all our community. Just a quick overview, I'll be, oops, I'll be very fast with that, as everybody know, here knows about Pandas, and probably everybody know, here knows about the Titanic dataset. So Pandas is this thing that you basically read CSV, even if it's a really bad format, but everybody loves CSV. So you just get it, you can visualize, then you can just check how many missing values are in the H column with a single line of code. You can impute them by the median with a single line of code and check again that it worked well. You can do quick, quick visualizations on the distribution. You can even get rid of all layers if you consider people over 65 or layers. That sounds a bit offensive maybe, but yeah. <laughs> I wanted to show <laughs> how you can imp like get rid of all layers in, in this data set in a single line of code. You can also group people in, in different bins, well, people or, or rows in different bins, also a single line of code, well, in this time it's three to make it look better, but it's literally a, a line of code. You can also do a nice visualization, a pivot table, when you can, in this case, I'm plotting like by gender, uh, by not gender, by, by age, the age group, and by the class where the people were traveling, which was the proportion of, of women. This doesn't look quite nice, so we can just format and, and rename things and that as easily as one line of code for everything. So basically, pandas provide like a function for everything you need, so it's just like single line of code for everything that you need to transform your, your data. So this talk is mainly an update on pandas, what's going on. I'll go quite fast with some of the things. I don't know if any of you has used or is still using the IX method. It's been deprecated for, I think, over a year now. It was a very tricky API, getting like a lot of magic. Lock and I lock are the right things for, for that. Panel is being deprecated. I don't know, panel actually was the origin of of pandas is the, actually pandas is short for panel data analysis and we're getting rid of panel, which is a bit weird. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to rename it to, I don't know, another name. Uh, there are alternatives for that, basically mainly the multi-indexing of, of pandas. 
those are not yet deprecated, but there are serious talks about deprecating, like the sparse data frame. I don't think anyone is, is using that uh, except for pandas get dummies. Does anyone use the, panda, the pandas sparse data frame except for the get dummies? Okay, I think that's good that I think we're going to deprecate that for sure then. <laughs> so yeah, it's not as sparse as the name says, it's like a um, compressed representation, but it's not as sparse as these, these formats, like the coordinate formats or something like that, and was never finished, it's a bit buggy, and, and yeah, I think it's better to, that at some point if someone has the interest, and I think it's a good idea that, that this is maintained outside of pandas. And then I'll spend a bit of time explaining why in place equals true is also something that we want to deprecate. I don't know exactly in which way. I'm sure many of you are using that. And actually, if you were paying attention, I used that in my previous example. <laughs> so that was intentional. So let's see why this in place is, is something tricky. This is basically what I shown before. It's the same exact exam example before, except for showing, checking the data and the visualizations and that. So I get the same exact result as before. And as you can see, I've got this, this in place here. So basically, this can be done in two different ways. The, I could assign the DFH to this, and I can avoid the in place. So usually, that's one of the, I mean, it's, it's possible to do it in place. Sometimes it, you save a bit of code, but it's like the alternative is quite easy. But that's actually not the alternative, preferred alternative. I think that's like really the way that we think that Panda should be, should be looking in the future, like just method chaining or this sort of pipelines. That's exactly the same as this code. It's doing exactly the same thing, and you can prove it like this. So you can read the CSV. Everything that it's being returned is a data frame. So you can filter. And before I was filtering these old layers or not old layers, I was just filtering old people for no reason. I I was assigning like re, re, like replacing the values for female people and male people with numbers to be able to compute these means on this, this percentage. Also for the age computing the means, doing the pivot table and renaming and the styling and, and everything. So I'm doing exactly the same thing and I'm doing this like I think it's much more compact code. So three main reasons and we'll see them one by one. Readability cons. I think I'm not sure how many of you are coming from a programming background, but readability counts. If you don't believe me, just import this from, from Python. And you can see here that Tim Peters basically wrote something that really, the end of Python that really tells you what's a good idea and what's not. And some, something funny because you do this, import this, and if you know that this code actually is encrypted, probably it's even funnier. But the thing is that this is very, very good guidelines, and I think the Python community, deserve, it's, it's really what it is today because of many of these things. There is also another one that says there should be only one and only one obvious way to do things. That's the in place, basically, it's breaking this principle too. And beautiful is better than ugly. I think the second code was more beautiful. That's a personal opinion, but yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that's going to the interest of having better code. So. The second one is lazy evaluation. I'll go quickly with that. It's a bit tricky, but I don't know how many of you know about generators. If you know anything about generators, you will know that this code generating 100 billion samples and sample, uh, sequ uh, sequential numbers and doing the square number of them basically takes mainly zero seconds. It's immediate because basically Python didn't do anything at all. And I have a very silly example to illustrate why. Imagine that. You are the programmer, I'm the Python interpreter, and you tell me, I want you to go to Japan and get one of these fancy cards that wave the, the arm. I go there, I bring it to you, and then when I arrive, you say, okay, now I want you to go to China and bring one of these cards because what I want is to compare the Chinese ones with the Japanese ones. And immediately after that, you say, okay, that was not very smart because I just went to Japan, I was just nearby China, and now I need to go back there. That was kind of very silly. If you tell me everything first, I can plan things and I can do them much more efficiently. That's mainly what it's happening here. Actually, it's happening in generators. It's happening for different reasons. But basically, this was, was doing was just like knowing what you want to do. So this map object that is being returned didn't do anything. It's just like recording what you want to do. So it's just knowing that you want me to go to China and Japan. And then when you need this data, it will be executed. So this lazy evaluation, when it's applied to pandas, we have some things like this. This where I'm sorting the values and then I'm taking the three first. That's just getting the three the three bigger values of a, a randomly generated million samples. That's cool, 
but it's it's the same thing as if I want the three tallest books from the th yeah the th three biggest books from from this shelf and I sort all them and then I check which one are the three. So that's not very efficient because I want to just check which are the three first and that. So if pa in in pandas there is a method in largest that shows basically that if you do this operation without sorting all your data and just going to the three first, it's much more efficient. This I think takes like one order of magnitude less than. Yeah, this is 163, this is 25 milliseconds, so it's literally like one order of magnitude faster. So by understanding all the operations, you can optimize things. If you really know all the stuff that, that needs to be done by this method chaining before doing anything and only at the very end you apply that, you can start optimizing the, the, the different tasks. And something even cooler, you can start distributing. This is what Spark or PySpark does. And this, this is from Dask, not from PySpark. But if you know that I want to go to Japan, I want to go to China and that, you can optimize and you can decide what are the sequence of things to do, which is the smart way to do, and even distribute it over a cluster of computers. So that's really like something that would be nice, and this in place would be a problem for, for doing that in terms of doing this method chaining. So these are some references because I'm going a bit fast and, and you might want to know more about generators, about this method chaining, this IBIS is a project that started to do this. You will have the slides, you can feel free to take pictures, but probably you won't have time in some cases. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing for this in place is these memory copies. If I create a data frame with a NAN and I do an in place and I fill a zero, what you expect is that you already have all this data in memory and don't, ex don't imagine now that we have two by two, that it doesn't really matter. Imagine that you have a terabyte in, a tera terabyte in your memory and you need to fill this, this missing value. Of course, you don't want to copy this memory. You want to go to the memory, go to the place where this is missing and fill it. That's quite simple. And in place suggests this. This is the idea of in place. But what happens if instead of going and filling with a zero, you fill with a string or something else? The in place is not as in place because pandas is tricky. And just go, we'll go very briefly. I don't go, have time to go to the details, but I'll provide more references as well. When you represent data in pandas or in a computer in general, the, there are different ways of representing. This is a, just a silly example showing number 79 in different representations. If you have an unsigned int of 8 bits, you will have this first number. If you have a signed int with 32 bits, you will have this other, and float 64, it's of course 64 bits. If you have a Python object, it's actually what you will have in pandas, is a memory pointer to a Python object that it's, it has different attributes, a reference count and that, that's something very internal of Python, but it's really what, it's, what you will have in memory. If you have a string representing this, you will have a different representation. NumPy, what it does is takes one of these types and create an array of values. So it's like saying, okay, now I decided that I have float 64 and I want 1,000 of them. So it takes a big chunk of memory, it assigns a type to it, and it assigns a shape. And that's basically what NumPy does, and then, all, of course, all the operations you can do. Pandas is a bit tricky because the data is heterogeneous. So internally, what Pandas has is a NumPy array for every different type. It's, this is named the block manager and it's quite a big mess. And the thing is that the, work, the way computers work, these different blocks of memory, every time you need to change the size of the type of this memory, you need to get new memory from the operating system and, and drop what you have in here. So if I want to add an integer column to this data frame, in this integer block, I need to add a new column, but it's not like adding a new column as simple as that. You need to basically create a new, a new block that is the same size as this one plus a column, move all the data there, fill the new column, and then get rid of that. That's basically how, how Pandas works, and it's quite a difficult problem to solve the way that, that those things work. So well, that's what I just said. So what is this important? Like, what's this a problem? Copying this memory and being allocating this new memory, getting rid of it, and, and, and like, copying it and deallocating it. Because processors, the speed of processors has been increasing like crazy. This, is, this starts from the 80, it's been increasing quite a lot. But the, the speed of memory, the speed uh, of accessing to memory, it hasn't increased as much as CPUs. So most of the times your program is not as slow as your CPU can process, it's as slow as you can bring data from the memory to the CPU or make the memory operations. Computers nowadays are, are mainly memory bounded and this is a problem when when you have these operations on allocating memory and making copies of your data every time there is a, 
there is an operation. It really, well, it's a problem in terms of performance. Your results will be the same, but it will take much, much longer. So going to this example, this is the example I had before. I had a missing value, and I have like, like these float values. And what happens here, what I was saying, if I fill with a value, with a value that it's a, a string, I had a, a block, a single block that it was uh, two by two. Now I, I have one block that is float and another block that is object. This means that all my memory, basically, I had to allocate again and copy the data from the previous block to the new blocks and then they allocate again. This is quite expensive and the thing is that this in place gives the intuition that this is not really what, what should be happening. So yeah. I'm not quite sure exactly which would be the new API for that. It's still under discussion, but this in place, I would personally avoid using it much unless you really know what you're doing. Because in some cases, if you are filling a value that doesn't have involved memory copies, that's the best way. But in, in some cases, that if you are doing only for the syntax, it's not good. So the thing is that the block, the block manager prevents that in-place operations are in place in terms of making in place of the memory. Uh, this in place true means uh, this in place true means doesn't mean that the memory is not being copied, so it can be misleading in this way. And actually, there is a you can when you are doing the other syntax that you are just assigning, you can just assign a reference and not the whole object, so you can still have the same results as the in place. You can do an in place in memory operation and and still have have these other syntax that allow you for for pipelines and that. You have here more references. This the second one is a talk I gave explaining all this stuff much more in detail at, at Pilot Data London this year at the conference. And just in case you are guessing, uh, Wes McKinney said at SciPy this year, the more you know about the, pa the Pandas data frame internals, the more horrified you are. It's quite true. And Wes McKinney can say that because he actually is not that much active in Pandas itself, especially in terms of coding because he started a new project that is Apache Arrow that it's basically a replacement for the block manager. Instead of doing these tricky hacks with, with, with NumPy to be suitable to, to, for heterogeneous data in, in Pandas, he is working on, on something, it's a C++ project. The idea is that it can be reused both by Pandas and R and any other, any other library. It, it's, it's an open standard, so it's even JavaScript implementation. So at some point, maybe people from JavaScript will be able to do data science in a similar way as Python, except for the really bad syntax of the language. <laughs> and you have more information about Arrow in, in these links, and yeah, I'm not the right person to go that much into the details. Arrow is already a stable product. It's already used in Pandas, but not as a backend. It's used mainly for transferring data. TurboDBC uses that, and you get one order of magnitude improvement in terms of speed compared to PyODBC, but using the buffers of, of Arrow. When you import data from PySpark to Pandas in the latest version, it's using Arrow too to make it faster. Parquet, if you don't know, it's a really fast format for storing data is like kind of a CSV, but in a binary format that it's much, much faster in, in many ways. Wes is hiring. Wes created a lab that got financing from some companies to hire people to work full time on open source. So if you know anyone or yourself uh, that is really good at C++ and really passionate about open source, just feel free to, to apply. And some other things happening in Pandas. It's, of course, a mature project, as we saw, and huge. So it's a lot of stuff in terms of bug fixing, automating processes for the release, and tests, and, and things like that, cleaning all the applications you saw. Also, staying up to date with the new versions, like making sure it's compatible with Python 3.7. There are interesting things. Since Python 3.6, dictionaries are, are sorted. Actually, in theory, since Python 3.7, it's when they are guaranteed to be sorted. But in Python 3.6, they are guaranteed. There are some things like, for example, when you create a data frame from dictionaries, if you are in Python 3.6, and I hope you are, you will get the, the columns in the right order. Also, when you are assigning, you can do fancy things like assign a variable based on the data on the data frame. And in the second one, this one is using the one that it's created in the previous record. Keyword arguments are like dictionaries. So if you are previous to 3.6, they are not sorted. So they will be executed in any random order. If you're in 3.6, this will be executed on order. So the assign method would be able to chain things that you can be computing one variable based on the one that you just defined. This. Great 
example. Then dropping Python to support. This is happening. <laughs> this is happening in in four months and a half. In 2019, pandas is not supported. The same for NumPy, Matplotlib, and that. I like the hoo hoo, but so you know, in SciPy, I was there in Austin this year. It was a big round of applause after that, and I will explain you why. Uh, this, just to contextualize, Python 3 has so many amazing features, just the last, the last versions and some of the ones I like, it's like plenty of stuff, but it's quite difficult to tell this number is 100 million, but you know it because it's the same as the one afterwards, and this is quite obvious that it's 100 million, that's only possible in Python 3.6 or, or after. Uh, F-strings, if you want to, to have a string, like a variable inside of a string, in Python 2, you used to do that. In Python 3, it supports these two things, like doing these two different versions. In Python 3.6 and later, you can simply add this f here, and in the, if the variable is defined, or even for expressions, you could say like, yeah, well, I don't, I don't want to spend time, but you can even have expressions in, in here inside the brackets, and it will, it will execute. Uh, things like tuple unpacking in Python, all versions of Python, if you want to get like the three elements for a list, like this first two and the, the last one, you need to do something like this. In the newest versions, you, I think this is from Python 3.4, I'm not quite sure, it's been there for a while. And you can just say like get the first, the second, the last, and everything in the middle, get into this variable named discard. So there are lots of pretty cool things, and there are just like a sample. There is lots of other cool things. The nice thing is that for you, for you, you have this. When you are in Python 3.6, you have all these features. Your code starts to look much better. What's the problem with pandas and other libraries? Your code is not getting better; it's getting actually worse because you are supporting Python 2, which means that something that in Python 3 it would be something as simple as that, you need to be compatible with Python 2. So your code starts to have these compat dot string types, compat string length. So you can, you need to start writing functions that basically replicate depending on the language. And even worst cases, if it's compatible your version with Python 3.6, you run one thing. If it's, if it's not compatible, you need to have the old implementation. So actually, it's making things much worse. So core developers actually need to spend a lot of time just making things, and the code looks much, much worse. So I think Python, Python dropping support for Python 2, it means that only, not only your code would be better because Python is getting better, but also Python, Python code, Pandas code would, would get better and all the other libraries. So I, I had the same slide before, just in case you feel like giving this round of applause as in SciPy. No? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're excited about it. <laughs> so extension arrays, that's the main development. I will go fast as the rest of the talk. But this is, uh, as I said, NumPy is being used in, for representing the data in pandas. If we have a, a NumPy type, what we have simply is like internally, it would be stored as a, as, a, as a NumPy type. If we check these values, this is representing like the, the, the same value in NumPy, and not much happened because actually pandas is already representing this internally. There are other types like category, for example, that they're not as obvious, and if you check values, this is not a NumPy anymore because NumPy doesn't have the concept category. So for a while, it's been different things like uh, date times with time zones that is not supported by NumPy, categories, and things like that. So recently, yeah, this is basically how is the representation. It's in this case, it's being, it's, being, it's being represented by NumPy, but by two different arrays, one for the indices and one for the, for the labels or for the categories. Uh, Tom from the Pandas core development team implemented something named Cyber Pandas that is an extension of Pandas for working with a type IP. So IPs are specific. They have internal types of uh, uh, a specific type of representation in terms of bytes and data and, and different operations. So what he did was built inside Pandas a system for having extension extensions in terms of types, and then building the, this as a plugin. So this is a, a separate library, but Pandas now has this. So everything like category and everything else is now moving to this. And now it's much, much easier to have custom types. For example, probably you know that if in Pandas you have integers and you have a missing value, this becomes a float. 
That's quite annoying, but integers, uh, none values don't exist in the integer world. I, I was showing before how, how things are represented in zeros and ones. There is no zeros and ones representation, no binary representation for integers with nuns. So if you try to force that, it will still break. It will say, no way I can represent this nun as, a, as an integer eight. But because of this extension, now it was somehow easy. And so how easy, I mean that Jeff Rebach did that, and I assume it was easy for him. It was probably something impossible for most of us. But yeah, now this is still in master. It's not yet released. But in the next version of Pandas, you will have this version uint8 that you will be able to have these integer values with nuns. This, I think, was the more one of the main complaints about Pandas. Then there is one of the Arrow developers implemented an extension type that it's mainly using as arrays. Here I'm generating a million of strings that it's a spam, sometimes ended with a comma, sometimes ended with exclamation mark. Uh, I'm counting how many of them ex ended with an exclamation mark. And I'm going to time how much is that. Of course, it's one third because I'm generating them like without waiting. And with this Fletcher, I'm able to represent the strings, that the strings are Python objects and are very slow in pandas at the moment. With this Fletcher extension, I'm able to represent them with this Fletcher string, that this is, this is arrow, this is a string, and this is much faster. So if I do that, this basically is giving like 40% of, of time in savings, 248 milliseconds to 168. This is still under development. I don't think it's ready for production yet, this Fletcher, but it's quite promising what, what it's going on. Some other stuff is happening, and I'm about to finish, is the documentation. There is a major refactoring of the documentation in terms of fixing the contents, making sure that every time you are looking for a Python method, for a pandas method, for a data frame method, or, or one of the functions, you get proper examples on that. This is the plot KDE that it was done during a, a sprint, and, and now it has plots. It has reference to other interesting pages. The parameters are well documented. Pandas documentation wasn't great, we're getting there, but it's still a, a lot of work. Uh, and also the style of the Pandas documentation page is not great. We are also changing that. It's still work in progress, but hopefully we'll get that soon. This is not in Pandas itself, and I'm almost finishing. I know I'm out of time already. Uh, this is in scikit-learn, but it was done by a Pandas core developer, so I think it's worth presenting it as Pandas thing. Uh, now scikit-learn will implement this, will, will have this make column transformer. It was quite tricky to, in, to apply in pipelines functions or transformers in the, in the scikit-learn terminology, uh, different transformations for single columns. That, so if you, are, if you are scaling your data, you were scaling everything. It was something named feature union that makes your code cryptic. Basically, it's totally... Uh, uh, impossible to understand in my opinion, so I actually implemented something like this and I assume most of you working with pipelines and circuit learn implement some sort of, of workaround to make sure that you are able to apply, apply transformations to each column if you are working with heterogeneous data. So this make column transformer, now it will be included. This is not yet released, it would be in scikit-learn 0.20, not sure when, when that is being released. So now it's as easy as say to the fair you apply the standard scaler and to the to these two other variables you, uh, you you apply the one hot encoder and if you deal with the one hot encoder you will know that it didn't work for strings it will in this next in this new new version so I think it's really really amazing because I think scikit learn is really a brilliant project and it's very very good but those were the main two problems at least for the kind of work I'm I'm doing so. Yeah, that's just like showing that, that you can then feed this pipeline and train models and, and whatever. I'm not even bothered on running this, but... Okay, run. Fuck off. I need to run both. So yeah, you get like the, the whole transformation with the, with the age uh, scaled and the, and the other two one hot encoded. This is more references about all this work in in scikit-learn. And just to conclude, the Pandas 1 roadmap, in September we're planning to release uh, 0 0.24 with these changes mainly about extension arrays, normal bug fixes and that. Then at the end of the year, just releasing a kind of final version before 1.0, 
which will contain all the deprecations we want to uh, of things we want to deprecate, and then 1.0, which will be 0 0.25, but well, where all this stuff is removed. So whenever you want to move to Pandas 1, the best strategy would be move to 0 0.25, make sure that your production code doesn't show any warning of deprecated things, fix it if that's the case, and then you should be safe to fix that. And then, after 1.0, we'll see what happens, but the commitment is not to break things until 2.0, so it would be for a while. If you want to get involved in Pandas development, uh, as I mentioned before, I help organize this, this group here in London. It's a great place when you want to get started contributing to open source, and everybody's welcome. If you are already contributing, everybody's welcome to mentor. That's probably more needed even than new contributors. If you want to get involved more in the economical level, you can support NumFocus. As I said, NumFocus is just like the legal entity that represents all us as an open source community. You can volunteer, you can donate, and more important, you can make your company involved. NumFocus is organizing a summit now for companies that are using these tools and they are critical for them. So they can meet the core developers and they can have discussions about the roadmap. So if that's the case of your company, you are making huge use of all these tools, just try to get into this forum and, and maybe support NumFocus. And of course, if you want to get involved in any other way, just feel free to contact me in the pub or in the, or in the internet. That's a picture from SciPy and that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. So we have time for one quick question before we go on to our lightnings. Do we have one? We have lots of questions, but <laughs> everyone will be in the pub afterwards. Uh, you, sir, given that you suggested the T-shirts, do you want to shout your question? Thanks. Great talk. I enjoyed it very much. My question is, you mentioned 5 to 10 million users. Uh, that's fantastic. I wonder, have the users been influencing the development? Uh, you mentioned things like cache misses and so on. And performance computing column uh, storage. Do you know like what people are doing with it? Is there like a feedback loop and are you exploiting that or is it all via Stack Exchange and GitHub? Uh, Could you repeat the question? Yes. Some analytics or yeah, so the question is about these five to ten million users we estimate that we have whether they are being they are influencing the development. Uh, yeah, for sure. You were mentioning GitHub and Stack Overflow. That's probably the main way they influence that. So yeah, of course there is a feedback loop. If you look, if you go to GitHub and you open an issue and you say this is slow or I want this or that, of course that's the starting point for the discussion. Even for core developers ourselves, this picture actually is the first time that the core development team met. So most of them, I think, just like probably Wes met Jeff. Well, actually, let me just for the. For the sake of fairness, let's. Yeah, Jeff was invisible. He's the he's the leader of the project, so that wasn't really fair. <laughs> so, yeah, there is there is communication. For example, with Scikit Learn, with the Stats models, projects like this, we check GitHub repositories. It's some sort of analysis when we want to deprecate something. Yeah, there is some sort of checking to the best of our knowledge, just trying to yeah, speak to users if that's possible, or just go to Stack Overflow, see who is asking about that, go to GitHub and see the projects. It's a bit not that trivial to go to GitHub and start looking for for things, but yet yeah, if, if we see that everybody in GitHub is using a feature, probably will be a bit more reluctant to, to get rid of that. So yeah, I mean, the ca ch communication channels are a bit tricky, I mean, it's like, it's. 10 million users, it's impossible to talk to all of them, but yeah, there is, we try to understand what's the community using and what's the, their concerns and problems. All right, let's thank uh, Mark again. <laughs>